Hey folks, Masako X here. As you may probably know, we here at the Masako X channel do like ourselves a little bit of conjecture and to muse a lot of the time. A few weeks ago, we made our cheeky movie TV villain switcheroo video, which you can check out up top by the way, as requested by one of our round table viewers, Mega Fox. As you can tell, we do like going with your ideas and considerations as we like to value your thoughts. And it seems that you folks liked the resulting video that was made. Because on the last round table as of this recording, that was about the 20th of March, we got another request from one of the stream's regulars, Vulcan, right here. What this all boils down to though, is that you lot like to see what we could do if we reverse the overall premise of our original topic. In other words, Vulcan and some of you want to see the other side of the switcheroo. Okay, we could do that pretty easily. How? Well, there are far less bad guys to cover for this one for starters. You know, since there are only three major villains and a few other minor villains that you can maybe upgrade to a movie villain. <sighs> Sorry, Raditz. We're just spitting facts based on the original version, to be honest. But to us, you are one cool guy. So without further ado, let's have some fun with the DBZ villain, shall we? The first movie that we would create based on this overall thought experiment we would name after a certain DS game which is very fondly remembered by the overall fandom. Simply because it just makes sense with the content, honestly. It's in the title and it makes perfect sense. Attack of the Saiyans is a pretty good moniker for a story introducing the likes of Raditz, Nappa and Vegeta because it's Saiyans who attack. What are the challenges that would come about from this supposed opening film for Dragon Ball Z? How do you change the story in order to make this work for a 90 or 100 minute opus? Well, to begin with, it has to have already happened in the timeline void after Turles was defeated. The old movies weren't exactly bothered with continuity all that much, with the possible exceptions of movies 5, 9 and 13, but that's for another video. So we're going to be keeping that overall tone in place. Also, we'd rather not have any of the main cast die in the middle of a more cinematic experience as this is really meant to be its own thing, self-contained, well, sort of. It works for a series where you can bring them back eventually, but to have Goku expire at Raditz's hand and then be brought back in the same movie, I don't know, that would feel a little rushed. So just like in the original saga, Attack of the Saiyans should start off with, well, Raditz of course. How could you not have that guy kick off proceedings? It's Raditz. Yeah, I'm getting the hackles up of those who down on Raditz, but I don't care. Which means that to make this more interesting, we need two things to go down in order for this to pan out the way we want it to. First, we have to make everyone else stronger, which makes sense based on their post turless experiences. And second, we need to also make Raditz stronger. Yay. The iconic moments in the story, like the farmer with shotgun and Raditz, that has to happen, obviously. It's such a short but important narrative scene to denote Raditz's power that it would be most egregious to omit it. And besides, the motivations cannot be very different or else it would completely ruin the overall tone. The biggest difference we would have, though, is that our monkey boy is scouting for the entire Saiyan trio, not just himself as he wants to recruit Kakarot into Vegeta's group in order to have a fourth for planetary conquest. And also have it so that means he's no longer the dog's body. Vegeta and Nappa are literally waiting in Earth's orbit instead of being one year in space away, ready for Raditz to collect the goods, what they came all this way for, and then just go about their business. We can also say that Goku's duel with Turles had made the galactic news networks, and it's what attracted Raditz back to his brother instead of it being a gut feeling, something to do with a hunch based around Bardock and Gine's original plan to send Kakarot to a distant and backwater world away from Freezer's view. In any case, the first duel that we would have in this movie would be between Piccolo and Raditz, like the original, but this time they're on pretty even ground. It would be much more equal here so to build up the suspense. However, cunning as always, Raditz would find a way to win. He would blind Piccolo whenever the Namekian would get any sort of an advantage and attempt to dart for trails of his brother's energy, get away from the fight, which would eventually take him to a party which is taking place at Kame House. Piccolo would be able to warn everyone though in the nick of time, and that means that Goku's brother cannot fully make use of his surprise attack and supposed supremacy. In this version of the story, 
the characters are already stronger than him. And even Gohan has some sort of battle practice and etiquette, so even though Raditz is much stronger here than the original story, with all guns blazing, he really can't wreck the party or try to force Kakarot to join him because he is quickly overpowered and beaten into submission. What would the party at Kame House be about? Well, it should be someone's birthday. Let's say... Uh, turtles. It's Thousand's birthday, why not? They gathered the Dragon Balls in readiness so the creature could maybe make a birthday wish on them. Well, I gotta say, that's one heck of a birthday present, right? But I mean, what could a turtle want? The world's biggest lettuce? Well, I mean, this is Dragon Ball, that's not entirely out of the realms of possibility. Someone would slip up, though, and through the Scouter and its audio channels, Vegeta and Nappa would hear about the whole ordeal that Raditz had failed spectacularly, and that they would have to go down there and clean up his mess that their underling had actually made, and oh, oh yeah, um, and some fools. Enter the Prince and the Baldy. In this version, however, Vegeta would dispose of Raditz for being weak instead of allowing him to escape and give Kakarot one last chance to join them, this time with much more seriousness and genuine peril, because Vegeta is actually somewhat impressed. Goku would flat out refuse, and a two-way fight would start right then and there. No fluff. Goku versus Vegeta, and everyone else versus Nappa. We would leave the battle between Goku and Vegeta practically unchanged, because come on, it's a classic. We would keep the overall flow of the original battle whilst maybe truncating certain areas to mean that you could slip the important parts into a 30-35 minute window, whilst Nappa would be taken down by the combined efforts of Piccolo and Gohan. But what would be the biggest difference overall in comparison to the series version? Well in the movies, Goku launches a successful spirit bomb on the first try at yeah, his enemies, so for Azaro Vegeta, sorry, you're done. Yeah, nice and simple. So for the second movie, that would be called Frieza, Emperor of Destruction. Now come on, be real. You would totally go and see that movie if it were called that. And this movie would feature the titular character making a full-scale invasion of Earth, after the news of his brother's demise in our original discussion video. Basically, Frieza was cooler, and cooler was Frieza. Turles would also join forces with our heroes for this one. And as for the TLDR, Cooler is officially unalive, and so in order to reassert his domination over the galaxy, Frieza wants to step in and take all the glory, gather the remnants of his brother's and father's empire, and goes all in for this last thing before he can have global and galactic conquest. And that's quite interesting on a few levels. First, it allows the Z fighters to deal with a full-scale invasion, similar to the one in the Moro arc, but much earlier on in the story, starting with Zabon and Dodoria, them being given the first push, and then giving Piccolo and Turles two pretty epic duels in the very early parts of the movie. But with all the soldiers and Ginyus present, this allows us to give every single character on the Dragon Team roster at least one cool moment, even Chiaotzu, with Goldo maybe, where they are seen taking down another baddie. That could mean that the Ginyus would be slightly less formidable and infamous than they are in the series, but on the other hand, it would involve really cool team-ups, so I think we'll win. Now, I think we can stomach that for the purposes of this discussion, yeah? If you want to think about it another way, imagine Chiaotzu and Tenshinhan taking on Raccoon, Krillin and Gohan dealing with Goldo, Piccolo fighting Berta, and then Roshi having to stall Jace with his experience on the battlefield, and with Turles body-swapping with Ginyu, perhaps. That would be so cool to see, and out there, that it would definitely spark interest. Meanwhile, Frieza would be a beast of an opponent, going slowly through his forms during the movie. Basically, he would be busy with Goku from the very moment that they lock eyes on one another. And when Goku goes Super Saiyan against 4th form Frieza though, he would eventually end up being a bit on the back foot, the Emperor, and so, like Cooler did in the original movie, he would have a fifth form. How would that look, I hear you ask? Well, I already did a full story whatever about it, so uh, I'll just reuse this image. So, this. But do go check out that full story video, by the way. I really like that one. But yeah, if my brother Cooler could have it, then so could I. Freezer would have to threaten to blow up the planet with his death ball to try and tip the balance in his favor again. But together with the combined might of his friends and allies, Goku would deflect it away and at the evil emperor himself, ending his reign and... Yeah, go on, Frieza can wind up in the sun. A fitting end for the bad guy. The sun's setting on his empire. Now, we're getting to the trickiest one on the list, but we think we might have a way to make it work. 
let's make it a sort of Alfred Hitchcock-esque movie and start off with a bang. We witness black-haired Trunks return into his timeline, expecting to get all the glory that he could expect to receive after solving the android crisis. But there is one problem. As he leaves the time machine, ready to sup in the afterglow of his efforts, and he's then greeted by a green being who gets the jump on him and, well, we're going to call this one Cell the perfect life form. Now the twist here is that we soon see a near identical Trunks preparing to say goodbye to the group, as the android threat has been ended in his own timeline. But this being trackable in timelines, it goes by a little differently. We just saw one interpretation. Already there is something fishy happening, as our heroes learn about a big fight going down on an island not too far from South City. It seems like there are more androids present, but in this version, they're fighting each other? Yeah. Both groups have very little regard for the collateral damage, however, and the safety of the general public. Amenbo Island is their battleground, being leveled in the midst of this epic duel. As the Z fighters get there, they witness a full on and rather equal, I must say, battle between 17 and 18, who are fending off 19 and 20, which is pretty shocking, as they recognize the deceased Jiro in the elderly android. What is going on here? Trunks here then explains that he is a copy of the Doctor's consciousness, which was saved into the supercomputer that has since then been uploaded to this new body. This isn't basically Jiro's body with a brain jar thing, but then again, it was never really properly explained how Jiro was able to turn himself into an android, but this is what have presented to me, so hey, I'll roll with it. Himself and 19 are fighting the rebellious 17 and 18, the ultimate parental struggle. Goku, Gohan, Tullus, and Trunks are unsure as to which side to take for this particular skirmish. So, they're caught between a rock and a hard place. Which side do they fight for? Should they even leave it alone and just pretend it wasn't there? So many questions right now. During the fight, our heroes then learn, or more like piece together through their own efforts, that the teenage bots broke free from the Doctor's control, that they weren't originally created by him, more like modified against their will. Well, that settles it. The heroes ultimately decide to help them instead of Jiro. This then causes a wounded Jiro to make a run for it back to his base to activate 16 as a last ditch effort to turn the tide back in his favor. And as for 16, ooh, he's unstoppable and spicy. Think Android 13, but this time really unstoppable and green. 16 is rocking the scene and is able to deal with all of the dragon team easily. But then Gohan is able to destroy the control device that turns this big android fellow into a much more mellow iteration. Way to go, Gohan! That's the way to use your noodle. Jiro then has no choice but to transfer his mind into a bigger, stronger version of himself. And there is a fight with... Mecha Jiro! Piccolo is investigating some weird happenings going around the planet and promptly encounters Cell. They fight, which ends with the monster's retreat. We then witness Cell licking his wounds, busy feasting on some people in order to get a quick boost before going back in for round two. During the fight with Mecha Jiro, 17 and 18 decide to give him a run for his money. But before they can mount a meaningful pushback, 17 gets ambushed by Cell, who then quickly absorbs him and transforms into his semi-perfect form. He then is able to defeat Piccolo rather handily. And as that's going on, the Z team defeats Mecha Jiro. They are then contacted telepathically by Piccolo to come to his aid and figure out a plan against this new encounter. Sixteen then helps them explore the laboratory of Jiro's to find some clues perhaps. And sure enough, they find the infant cell and learn everything as to the exposition about this from this trip. Gohan and Goku then go to help Piccolo, whilst Bulma informs everyone else that she found a second time machine. Trunks then figures out what happened, and he's not happy. Sixteen then goes on to protect Eighteen, but Cell is able to get his way and transformed into his perfect body. They then have a climactic duel against Cell and the Cell Juniors, which then of course leads to Sixteen sacrificing himself to aid Gohan. Gohan goes Super Saiyan 2, and is able to literally beat Seventeen and Eighteen out of Cell, and finish him off. No perfect cell this time around. 17 and 18 are obviously thankful for this act of bravery and mercy, and decide to hit the road and promise not to cause any more damage or pain to the world, and instead, they'll just live. All Cell's victims then get revived by the Dragon Balls, and the androids get their bombs removed too as a token of appreciation. Now, for the final movie, that would be called The Margin Conspiracy. So how would that go down? Well, actually, 
It would be, more or less, focused around the 25th Tenkaichi Budokai, after the defeat of Hirudagan. The wizard Barbary would want to use the powers of the fighters in the tournament to really just revive Boo, resting within a sealed ball under the tournament arena. So we're not having it out in the middle of a wasteland like we do in Dragon Ball, we're going to bring the thing right under the tournament grounds. Shin and Kabuto would be here to lay down the exposition. No Yakon or Pui Pui, it would just be Barbadi, Deborah, Spopovich and Yamu, with Deborah participating in the tournament instead of just standing next to Barbadi for most of the saga. Margin Turles would be a thing against Goku, as Barbadi would hijack their fight. Essentially, it would just be a series of battles, Videl vs Spopovich, Gohan vs Deborah, and then Goku vs Turles, or Margin Turles, which would then lead to Margin Buu being freed. Now, the biggest change here? No good Buu. It would just be Super Buu. He being the most chaotic one of all, who would immediately turn on his master, as well as Deborah, destroying them completely as if they were nothing. After that, the monstrosity would start absorbing everybody else, changing through his various forms, not for any meaningful amount of time, just for like snippets as a reference to the original. Seeing his family being absorbed obviously would be enough to knock Turles out of his margin state, agreeing to fuse with Goku into Takarot, the metamoran version of their fusion. In the end, it is just basically Kid Buu versus Goku, who destroys the monster with the spirit bomb because it works in the DBZ movie, so there you go. Easy. The Buu saga actually has a lot of fluff that can easily be cut when you get down to it, so actually, I think that plot could easily fill in a two-hour movie with very little difficulty. In fact, if you want to see another version of how the Buu saga could work with less fluff, check out Totally Not Mark's version of the Buu saga. It's actually really good. But what do you think of this video? Do you like our movie versions of the TV series and characters? How would you handle it? We would definitely like to know, and we would love to hear your thoughts, so be sure to leave them down in the comments, and I shall see you in the next video. Catch you later!